Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. My guest today is a very special musician and composer, Yoni Avi Batat. He's a multi-instrumentalist. He will tell you how many instruments he actually plays. He's a singer and songwriter who recently released his debut album called Fragments. It's a collection of original and traditional music that was incubated and explored from the perspective of his Iraqi Jewish and Ashkenazi Polish Jewish identities. You may remember seeing Yoni playing the violin so expertly in the band's visit on the show's national tour. Yoni's written lyrics in Arabic, Hebrew, English, and Yiddish, sometimes all in the same song. His music draws on Arabic modes and rhythms with an ensemble of traditional Arabic instruments that highlight Yoni's multifaceted, or as he'd put it, fragmented identity. Yoni is a graduate of Brandeis. He has a master's from Boston University. He studied the violin and the oud instruments extensively in Jerusalem. And he continues a long legacy of Iraqi Jewish musicians. Until 1950, almost all professional instrumentalists in Baghdad were Jewish. And with Yoni's album Fragments, he can now claim his own place in a distinguished lineage. Welcome, Yoni, to the broadcast. It's great to have you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm talking to you. You're in Israel. I know you move around a lot, but I'm here to where you are. <laughs> yeah, right now I happen to be in Netanya, Israel. I'm living this year in Jerusalem. And uh, right, that just happens to be where I am right now. And most of my life I've spent uh, in the Boston area. And, and I also feel a calling to to do my work as a musician in America, even though I'm doing the work here right now. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. I'd love to just start with all the instruments you play, um, because I know you're called a multi instrumentalist. But just mm -hmm. if you can tick them off, and also sure, the yeah. languages that 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 you are writing in. Sure. Yeah, I, I started on violin when I was four, and then then started also with viola when I was in uh, high school. And then, yeah, since around then also I've been playing the oud, which is um, Middle Eastern lute type instruments, like a predecessor to the guitar and singing for as long as I can remember. Um, those are like the main instruments I, I perform on. And uh, yeah. You, as for, you had you know, a group when you were 16 before you, you kind of went into this sort of research and, and self-exploration. Tell us about your band uh, uh, started at 16 years old. Am I right that you yeah. You guys did gigs where you did cocktails and a horror. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I had a it's like a, the the businessman of of the musician, young Yoni, uh, had a had a klezmer band with my sixteen year old friends, uh, where we we were called the Klezmaniacs, uh, and now uh, and we played you know klezmer music for uh, events, and it was really sweet. Um, but and so that's when I started singing in Yiddish. That's when I started uh, playing klezmer music. Uh, I started learning to uh, improvise on the violin th uh, through that band and through a lot of other experiences like that. And then slowly, slowly got into the to Arab music and um, wanting to investigate more the music of my Iraqi Jewish ancestry. So let's talk about that investigation, because it was fascinating to me. So many people oversimplify Jewish heritage and identity. And I think you're a snapshot of not only how complex and colorful it can be, but also how rich and the directions that it takes you. Um, and not just culturally and maybe even religiously um, or ritually, but um, musically. So can you just tell us a little bit of, sort of what led you to even kind of begin to unpack your past? Yeah, totally. Well, first of all, I grew up with a strong Iraqi identity at home in my house. Um, I heard tasted the foods of Iraqi Jewish uh, ancestors. And I, I even heard some of the music, although I didn't have a synagogue or, or Jewish community where I felt that uh, identity reflected back to me. Um, so it felt like I was putting all this effort into klezmer music, but I felt that I was neglecting such an important part of, of who I am and, and an important part of my, my own ancestral and spiritual journey. And so that's when, when I was 16, I kind of started this very, very long journey of, of, of learning Arab music and learning Iraqi Jewish music and Mizrahi music. Um, and it was really tough because uh, there were, there's not a lot of opportunities in America of people who can teach this and, and there's, and also, I was involved in a lot of liberal Jewish communities and, and um, most of those spaces uh, didn't have a lot of representation of, of Mizrahi Jewry. So it was, an, it was really an effort to, uh, to kind of go around and collect these melodies. And I felt like I was learning the repertoire and this musical style 
just like I, I'm learning the language Arabic as an outsider. It feels like even though it's mine and even even though it's a part of me and my ancestry, I'm approaching it in a way that's very intellectual, that's very um, it's it's almost disembodied in a way. And, and that's what's led me to my album Fragments, which which was really um, an expression of this very human experience of feeling a fragmented identity, feeling that maybe you're coming to your own culture and your own heritage as an outsider, but to find acceptance and beauty in that experience. And what I loved is this is a quote of yours that even if something you found wasn't an actual memory of yours, that it helped you realize that memory isn't always about the specific facts and details. For me, it's often more about trying to find some sort of an emotional, aesthetic, visceral, sensory connection. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because I, I think that all of us can relate to the idea that you almost feel like you experienced something you didn't when you taste something, when you hear something. Totally. I, and I think that's the spiritual aspect maybe that you were talking about earlier is that um, finding connection and groundedness in our ancestry can be such a spiritually fulfilling experience. And through this album, I was trying to investigate my ancestry and I was trying to find out some specific details about them. And, and I found that I wasn't able to so easily. And ultimately, what I realized is that in order to get the result that I wanted, which is a sense of spiritual connection, a sense of some sort of a redemption or, or a, 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 a spiritual groundedness in who I am, I could do that even without the facts and details. And I can do that by imagining the sound of my ancestor's voice. Or, or for example, on one track of the album, I use um, this quote from Psalms, praise God with a chinor, with a kinor, um, which is this instrument that we don't know what it was when the Psalms were written. And so by using this instrument called a joza, which is a coconut spike shell violin, um, I'm evoking the sounds of what our ancestors might have played to praise God. And so, so this is like the little, little bits of sensory pieces of information that help to color in our imagination and really help us to give us that spiritual connection with, with ancestry and tradition, even if it doesn't come from specific details. Like in the, in the example of that Kinor, I don't actually know if this coconut shell spike fiddle is what they used. Um, but it doesn't matter. Hey, actually, it's is that a real point. coconut? Or is that a yeah, term made of out phrase? of a real coconut? Yeah, it's called Joza, and it's specific to Iraq. Every a lot of areas in the Middle East have their own uh, version of a spike fiddle, which is like a ancestor of the violin. Um, and the Joza is specifically for Iraq, and that's why I wanted to use it uh, in this album. So let's give uh, our viewers a taste of your music on fragments, and I want to particularly uh, zero in on the piece Vapor. And can you set it up for us because I just love the fact that it is um, in multiple languages. Beautiful. Yeah, this one, this one was a really fun challenge for me. I wanted to give voice to the way that language can carry memory and carry ancestry and also give voice to this jumble of languages that I have in my head, Yiddish, Arabic, Hebrew. These are all languages of my ancestors, uh, and I wanted to put them together in a song. Uh, so I put, pulled together disparate texts. One is from Mansour al-Halaj, who is a contemporary of Rumi, um, a Sufi poet. And then there's a Yiddish poet from the 1960s, and there's um, a piece of liturgy, Jewish liturgy. And I put those together because I was able to draw a connection between the themes of each of those texts around finding uh, beauty in the fleeting nature of our existence. And when I think about my own uh, experience of trying to connect past to future, uh, it's both really rewarding and beautiful. And also at the same time, it's like, our lives are nothing and then it's over. Um, and so this this song using those three languages gives voice to that very human experience of. And before we play it, uh, am I right then that the lyrics are all drawn from sources? They are not your invention. Your invention is the, is the weaving together. Am I right? Yes, yes. And um, that's part of my fragmentation is that my Arabic is not good enough and my Yiddish is not good enough to be able to write texts in these languages. We always and, uh, appreciate humility on JBS. Say that again. We appreciate humility on JBS. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah and it's so, a long journey. Um, but but I, I, I was able to weave these texts together in a way that I think brings new meaning to them and, and interesting connections between texts that and authors that never would have even been in the same room together or in the same brain together necessarily as an idea. So that's what's exciting to me about And this the song. collaborators that we're going to be seeing, can you tell us a, a bit about them? 
Yeah, so in this song, uh, my main collaborator was Anthony Mordechai Tzvi Russell, who's an amazing um, Yiddish opera singer, actually. Uh, uh, has an amazingly rich voice. But actually, on, on this track, what he did with me is he helped me make sense of all the poetry. I know he has a real eye for um, pulling uh, narrative together from different sources, and he helped me um, take, we had a Google Doc with about 20 different uh, possible texts and he helped me zero in on where we wanted to go with it and how we wanted to lay it out. So he was really an important collaborator and you hear his voice very gently underneath um, in a few moments. And then the rest of the musicians are, it's a traditional Arabic ensemble. Uh, we have, I'm playing the Oud, um, there's violin and viola, uh, there is also Ney, which is a reed flute, it's kind of played uh, like on an angle like this. And then, um, yeah, cello, uh, kanun, which is a zither, also a, a, a traditional instrument, frame drum, uh, authentic percussion instruments. Uh, yeah, my goal was to create a song that that embodies traditional music, even though it's something new that never has been experienced before. Wonderful. So we are going to listen for a minute to Vapor. Wonderful, wonderful, Beautiful. I will also say that I'm not sure it's entirely like top 40 material. <laughs> I'm wondering how do you see the accessibility of this? It's it's it it's absolutely affecting, it's moving. I think it's actually educational. Um, again, I just love that the languages are intertwined. But when you think about how this will be heard, are you thinking a concert setting? Are you thinking people just listening to the music on earphones, singing it themselves, having it appear perhaps in ritual in some way. Um, give us a sense of your vision or hope for it. Well, this song in particular, I think, is is a performance song. It's not one that really invites a lot of uh, audience participation or sing along, and, and I recognize that. Um, there, for me, there's, there's a real important connection between this intellectual understanding of language and, and the visceral understanding of a song. Um, and I think it's very easy to hear this song even without knowing what the words say um, and to let it wash over you and experience the sound mm. of these languages. I've also gotten the feedback from people that uh, very interestingly, they can't hear the transition between the different languages. It all kind of sounds like maybe part of the same. I, I and, felt that. I felt that too. It's like you had to pay attention to the subtitles in a way. Right. Right. So, per so perhaps there's something there as well of like, this is all, this is all of these sounds can come together, uh, the sounds of the languages. And then on a deeper level, I think listening to it while understanding what it says, hopefully can give inspiration and meaning, uh, just like any good piece of art can to, to people. I can say more generally in my, in my work, I, I, uh, I'm looking to bring more Iraqi and Arab Jewish music to synagogue spaces uh, and and into prayer, both traditional pieces and pieces of my own. Um, and I've been lucky to be able to do that uh, and have people sing with me and, and bring these ancient melodies and, and ancient musical modes. Uh, that's been the biggest learning curve for me is learning these very exact, specific, beautiful, um, expressive um, intonations that are specific to Arabic music and to be able to bring that aesthetic, which is very foreign to um, Americans uh, into the synagogue and into into Jewish expression. How have your parents responded to to your work? Um, are they feeling like in a way you're connecting them back uh, to each of their heritages? And do they kind of understand um, what you're trying to do? 
Yeah, it's interesting. My so my dad is the Iraqi one. My mom, my mom's side is Ashkenazi. Um, they've both been very supportive of my music over the years, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, the my dad specifically um, on the Iraqi side, it's it's very interesting because he has his own fragmented experiences as well. Growing up in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem specifically. He was embarrassed to speak Arabic in public. It was it was not um, socially acceptable. Although that was his the language, the only language he could communicate with his mm. own grandmother in. Um, it was very challenging for him, and so he, in a certain ways, he sort of washed the Arabness and the Arabic language out of his Jewish identity. And I don't fault him for that. It's 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 a natural part of uh, of of what happened. Um, as much as it's very sad to me. Uh, but he also has a deep love for Mizrahi pop music. So that's like not exactly the same thing. It's like an Israeli genre that's emerged combining a lot of these inspirations and sounds, but is kind of its own thing altogether. Um, and I grew up on those sounds as well. Uh, but he also, he does speak Iraqi Arabic and he, and he loves to speak Iraqi Arabic. And I heard him speak that. And, and whenever he hears this music, there's occasionally something that'll like, pique his interest and he'll recognize something. I, I always ask him, hey, dad, do you know this melody? I just learned this with my teacher. And normally the answer is actually no. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like kind of uh, excavating even further back than my than my dad's generation. But occasionally he'll say, oh, yeah, how do you know that song? And he'll like be surprised that I that I somehow learned this music that he that he knows. Um, actually. And what about your mom's side? Um, is the Ashkenazi melody coming through? Yeah, well, so I, I, I spent years uh, playing playing uh, klezmer music, and and from a from a young age, I had a lot of access. I actually was really lucky. I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut area, where we had a intergenerational klezmer big band, kind of a pickup band, where I where I learned to play klezmer, and I, I also learned Yiddish in college. I had so much access to be able to explore klezmer music from a young age, um, and even this led to. Uh, the formation of of a of a band as a professional musician called Two Shekel Swing, um, which 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 was uh, kind of a combination of Manouche uh, Parisian style jazz swing with uh, with klezmer music, and so of course you know she's very proud of that, but she's also she's very um, my mom is very aware of 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 the many different cultures in our family and and is very proud that I'm that I'm expressing all of them very lucky. So you mentioned them. two shekel swing, and I would love to give our viewers just a taste of that, even though I know that's your past life. Um, a bit and this song is called Seven Shekel Swing. Let's listen now. That was wonderful. Um, I want to just uh, drill down on the word fragments or fragmentation. You've used it a lot. It's the name of your of your album. And this is a quote you gave to 972, a magazine in an interview with your sister, Sivan. You say, Mizraz Mizrahim have experienced fragmentation in a particular way. The withholding of memory, facts and details is sometimes intentional specifically in the complexity of our ancestors that came from Arab lands to Israel-Palestine. You touched on that before with your dad, kind of, you know, not feeling he could speak openly his native language. Can you talk a little bit more about where, what you mean by withholding memory, facts, and details? Yeah, I think, I think Israel as a project was very complicated for Arab Jews in particular, and in a way, in, in, in Mizrahi Jews in a way that it, that it wasn't complicated for other Jews. Uh, all of a sudden, they were living in a place where their mother tongue was the language of, of the supposed en enemy. Um, mm -hmm. And so it created this very complex political structure, um, you know, without going 
in too detail uh, uh, about what happened, but it created a, a situation where um, my grandparents, for example, who came from Baghdad, were were living um, were were saved in a lot of ways by have, having the opportunity to come to Israel and, and having having a, a, a homeland for the Jews, and also were oppressed in a lot of ways. And so they were in this very difficult situation of how much do they. Uh, do they rebel? How much do they protest? How much do they accept? Um, and, and I do think Mizrahi Jews were in a particularly difficult situation navigating those waters. And I think ultimately a result, uh, you know, which is documented by some some scholars, um, Yali Hashash to name one, um, uh, it's documented that, that these Mizrahi Jews, especially Moroccan Jews, Yemenite Jews, they decided what to pass on and what not to because they didn't want to complicate things too much for their children. Um, and so this experience of not knowing a lot of specific facts and details that we were talking about before, that's something that I've I've heard resonated back to me by so many different people, not just Jews, not just Mizrahi Jews, but especially Mizrahi Jews. And, and in my work of putting this album together, I um, I led workshops for, for the community where, where we got to talk about our fragmentation. And it was very interesting because I, I did some workshops that were um, open to the public, some that were for young people, some, and then some were that, that were specifically geared towards Mizrahi Jews, Jews of color, um, Jews of Sephardic origin, indigenous Jews, Latinx Jews. Um, and in those spaces, it was so interesting. In, in, in the other spaces, I had to explain what fragmentation is and why I'm, I'm writing about this and what the experience is, and everyone's like, okay, okay. And then after a while, they all were like, oh yeah, I'm fragmented too, and they were able to say, what what it is that they were that, that they what experiences they've had that led to their own fragmentation but with the mizrahi jews and the jews of color i didn't even have to explain anything as soon as i said the word fragmentation they they know exactly what i was talking about and 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 so through the studies and scholarship that i've read and also through my own personal experience of interacting with mizrahi jews i've seen that this is true that fragmentation and withholding of memory. Some of it is accidental. Some of it is on purpose. I, I certainly wasn't trying to say that everything is on purpose, um, but I think it's 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 uniquely complex um, because mm. of because of Israel and because of the place of Mizrahi Jews in Israel. And I know we would need another hour for this in terms of conversation about Israel. But since I'm talking to you while you are there and you spend so much time there, I wonder if you see your work, your music, your composition and your exploration of these issues that you've articulated so beautifully. Do you feel like you have a role to play in answering this moment where anti-Semitism and particularly anti-Zionism is at its height? I feel like my work is more in America, to be perfectly honest. I'm here, um, I'm here soaking up as much as I can because there's a lot of opportunity here and there's a lot of master musicians here who I can learn from. But I see my role 100% is in bringing Arab Jewish music to Jewish communities in America. And I do see that as a way of fighting anti-Semitism. I think by tying our liberation together with Muslims, with Arabs, with other marginalized communities in America, I think that to me is the most surefire and, and uh, empowering way to fight anti-Semitism and hatred uh, in America at the very least. And since we had musician and composer Joey Weisenberg, he's a song leader extraordinaire from Hadar's Rising Song Institute, You've worked with him, you know him. Tell me a little bit about where that's been a growth area for you. Yeah, Joey's a super inspiring figure. Um, he's been a mentor to me for sure. And, and we're actually working now on uh, developing an album for Rising Song Institute that focuses on Mizrahi Pew team. We're working with an amazing singer named Yosef Goldman, who is background is Syrian Turkish. Um, and we're putting together this amazing album for American audiences, which is enacting this exact mission that I'm talking about of bringing these melodies to uh, American spaces. Um, he's he's been a real inspiration, especially just as a as a as a musician, just to know what it's like to be a musician, a parent, uh, uh, you know, a, a macher, a doer um, all at once and how to how to let all those things coexist and flourish uh, in your life. Uh, that's been the biggest thing I've gotten from him. And before I let you go, Yoni, tell us about your plans for your second album. Am I right that you said you're focusing on hands and their power to give, receive, create, bless, and love? That's what I read. Am I right? Yeah, I'm trying to even think where you read that from because that it's correct. And uh, I don't even remember where I put that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, I, I have this idea uh, for the next album. 
uh, which comes from an Iraqi expression, an Iraqi Jewish expression that's called the ashtidak. When you say ashtidak to someone, it means may your hands live on. Um, and it's, it's a way of saying good job. And it's also a way of saying, bless the work of your hands. It's a way of saying, thank you so much for creating for me what you created for me. Um, and I see so much power in, first of all, I want to bring this word to American audiences. I hear people say Yishar Koach or Yishkoyach in this sort of Yiddishism uh, Ashkenazi way, which is beautiful. And I love it whenever someone says Yishkoyach to me, I, 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 I feel full of pride and, and uh, Translate uh, it for people who might not oh, know. Oh, is Yeshar Koach. May your strength be straight, I think. Um, it's like, it's a way of saying good job. Good job. Um, good job. And, and well done. I've, well done, yeah. And what I've learned recently is that Ashtidak, which is this Iraqi Judeo-Arabic word, is used in much of the same way. When someone does a good job, you can say Ashtidak, good job. Um, and so through this album and through, you know, in general, what I'm trying to do in the world is bring more, uh, you know, like we have so many Yiddishisms peppering our uh, Jewish English vernacular. I would love for there to be some Iraqi Jewish expressions in there. Why not? Um, so that's that's one song on the album. There's also other songs about um, with the priestly blessings, thinking about the power of hands as, as blessings and and also other uh, inspiring texts. Potech et yadecha, open your hands, umaspia, lechol chayratzon, and instill in all living thing uh, desire. So so these are the kinds of inspirations I have and, and it's, a, it's a work in progress. We will look forward to it. Yoni, as uh, you've just taught me, Ashtidak, is that correct? Yes, you got it. I Thank need to you. practice. I need to practice. Yeah, Thank you for joining us on In the Spotlight and to everyone watching, I hope you will get fragments, download fragments, uh, check out Yoni's uh, website and also his videos on YouTube. Thank you for being with us and let's keep the music close. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. See you next time. Thank you.